Come and worship. Come and worship. Worship Christ, the newborn King. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we hear your call to come and worship, to worship you, Lord Christ, our King. You are no longer the newborn King, but you are the Messiah who was born for us in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. You are the one who lived that perfect life on earth for us 2,000 years ago. You are the one who died on the cross, was buried and rose from the grave and has ascended to heaven and sent your Holy Spirit into our hearts to strengthen us, to live for you, to know your fellowship in our lives. And for all of that, we want to say thank you today. It brings us to worship you and to praise you. Please receive us into your presence. Speak to our hearts. Strengthen us as we go forth into this coming week that we would serve you well and glorify you as we seek to praise your name. We ask in your most holy name, Lord. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us for the online ministry of the First Congregational Church of Wyndham. We're rounding out the Christmas season today, celebrating Epiphany two days after the official day on the calendar. But it enables us to wrap up the themes of Jesus, the promised one, as it pertains to his birth. We're going to continue the theme of Jesus, the promised one, as we go through the Gospel of Matthew from now through Easter. Uh, we're going to take kind of a quick journey through that book. And I want to get to know Jesus again a little bit better, see him fresh and come to walk in his steps and hear his words and rejoice in him, hopefully getting to know him better as, as God's great gift to us. So I'm glad that you've been able to join us so far, and I hope that you will be able to continue. Please sign in and let people know that you're here. Uh, I get to see people on Sundays, so I know who's able to be a part of our in-person congregation. I don't often get to know who a lot of folks are in our online congregation. Uh, it would be a great encouragement to be able to see you there, to hear from you. Um, maybe something that the Lord has spoken to you or, or a way that you've been encouraged or even a prayer request. Uh, we're happy to receive prayer requests that we'll share if you wish so that people can uplift you in different things that are taking place. So I hope that you will greet one another and it'll be good to hear from you. I don't really have much by way of announcement this morning, so I'm going to just dig right into the scriptures. Uh, the first passage is the promise from Isaiah chapter 60, and it is one of the great messianic promises. Uh, Isaiah is a great book full of messianic promises. As I've been reading through the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew quotes immensely from this from the book of uh, Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah is almost like a New Testament book in the Old Testament. But uh, here from Isaiah chapter 60, beginning with verse 1. Isaiah 60, uh, verses 1 through 6. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness will cover the earth, thick darkness the peoples, but the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons will come from afar. Your daughters will be carried on the hip. And you will see and be radiant. Your heart will thrill and exult because of the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The wealth of the nations shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you, young camels from Midian and Ephah. All of those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense. They shall bring good news and the praises of the Lord. And then from the book of Matthew, chapter 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all of the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. 
They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. When you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. They fell down and worshipped him. And opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we pause for this moment of prayer, I continue to be so amazed at how you wove together the tapestry of Scripture. How you spoke words in the pages of the Old Testament, and hundreds of years later, you brought those words to pass in the events of the New Testament. I hear the words from Isaiah about kings, about leaders, great people coming before you and gold and frankincense and people bowing before you. And then I read in Matthew when you were born and magi, very significant people from the East come and they are bearing gold and frankincense and they are bowing in worship before you. Lord, it is such a beautiful tapestry of Scripture and just speaks to your power. It speaks to your faithfulness, because when you say something, you mean it, and you will make it happen, even if it's hundreds of years later. Thank you, Lord. If you are able to do that, what are you limited by in working in our own lives? What, what promises will fail? None. You have the ability to perform in us and for us the things that you've promised. And so we thank you for that today. Lord, thank you for a, a great gift that many are celebrating, and that is the, the young football player who was injured so terribly a week ago. Um, he's had some conversations with people and with his teammates, and they're Hearts have been lightened so greatly because of actually being able to talk with Damar. Lord, I ask for your continued mercy in his life, that, that he would know clearly it is a gift of God that has restored him at all and certainly restored him so quickly. And I pray, Lord, that the, the act of prayer that we've seen so much uh, now would transform lives of the people who engaged it. Um, it's not just an act, it's not just a sentimental thing, but speaking to you is real. Talking with you has real results. So I pray that you would transform many lives through the power of things that are taking place and that the Mar would be able to give glory to you. Lord, we also wanna lift up our government to you the dysfunction in Washington was on clear, clear display for us to see over the course of this week. It does not bode well for decision making, for working together, for leading um, our country toward health. You know, some people, I guess, think that Washington can't do that anyway. But uh, right now, I just think of the animosity and the, the, the hatred the, the violent disagreement and ability to work together. Lord, we just pray for the leaders that are above us now. 
We just commend them to you and commit them to you for your mercy. First, that they would repent. They would repent of pride and arrogance, and they would humble their hearts before you as they would have the responsibility of leading a nation. They forget that all leaders are accountable to you. They will all give account to you for the choices they've made and the things they've done in leadership, as we all will with all of our lives. They will have a great responsibility, a great accountability because of the responsibilities that they have. So I pray for them from our president down to our state leaders, to our local leaders, as Paul commands in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, to pray for your leaders that we might have peace and ultimately that that would enable the gospel to go forth freely and successfully. We seek that today, Lord. Lord, we bless your name. We think of people in our lives who need a special pouring of blessing, people dealing with cancer, with recovery from injury, with financial and relational issues. And we ask that you would hear us now in the quietness of these moments as we would lift them up to you. Please hear us, O oh Lord, we ask. Lord, what a privilege it is to bring these things to you in prayer. To know that we're not just thinking thoughts. We're not just sending messages up into the sky. But as children of yours through Christ, we have an audience with the King of Kings. We have a place before the throne of our almighty God. And you listen. Lord, what a gift. So we thank you for that today as we commit these things to you. And if there are ways that you would use us in response to the things that we've prayed for, please show us, equip us, and motivate us. We thank you as we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. For this morning's message, I would want to come back to Matthew chapter 2. And I am just going to begin with the first two verses. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. Come to worship him. In 2 Corinthians 1, verse 20, Paul writes this, All the promises of God find their yes in Christ. All the promises of God find their yes in the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is through Jesus Christ we shout our amen to God for his glory. As we have worked our way through the Advent and Christmas season, we've been focusing on God's promises. And in a very practical way, Christmas is the epitome of a season where the promises point toward a very, very specific time history. Uh, that is the birth of Christ in Bethlehem over 2,000 years ago. It signals to us the reality that God makes promises. God is the one who comes to us. He initiates relationship with us. He initiates words of promise. And then he goes so far as to bind himself to those words, whether it's an oath he makes or a covenant that he makes, or simply saying over and over and repeating it again that what I say I will do. Sometimes that is on, on the macro or large universal scale in terms of the grand events of history. And sometimes that's on the micro or personal scale, the things in your life and my life. But I would declare as we start this morning, God makes promises. Can I hear an amen to that? God makes promises. 
And as Peter describes those promises in 2 Peter chapter 1, he calls them precious and very great promises. How many of you have God have experienced God making to you a precious and a very great promise? I'd love to hear your amen or type it in on the screen. God's promises will never fail. God's promises will never falter because his word is true and Jesus keeps his promises. As Paul said, we shout our amen to God for his glory because all of the promises find their yes in Christ. The life of Jesus in its entirety is such a summary and a a wealthy reserve of all those promises leading up to his birth and through and how he conducted his ministry in his life, the things that he taught, the manner in which he died and the reason and the purpose for which he died, his burial and then his resurrection on the third day, his ascension to glory, the gift of his spirit who he sent to us on Pentecost so that you and I could have a new power for living because we have been forgiven and he's come to take up residence in our lives. God's promises are all for us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Yes and amen. Jesus Christ came into the world as a gift from the Father so that you and I might live. And yes, that means eternally. Certainly the hope is eternal life. But what if we actually thought about it this way? The promises that we have in Christ give us hope that we might live in him now, not just with our eternal life, but with our daily life. The promises that the Lord has given to us in Jesus enable us to live now. A large aspect of the nature of that promise is the difference that he wants to make in our lives. Some of that difference we're going to see, as I mentioned earlier, over these next weeks as we continue in the life of Christ in the Gospel of Matthew. I was realizing that often we spend all this time talking about the birth and getting ready for the birth, and then in the winter we go off and do something else, and then we come back to the crucifixion in the spring. And, and I was just struck by the thought, you know, I think this year, I think we need to walk with Jesus a little bit. And I want to invite you to walk with him, uh, reading through the Gospel of Matthew over these next 14 or 15 weeks as we prepare for the Easter season. As we walk with him and we experience the promises of God in his life in our relationship with him. This morning... I'd like to, to begin that by focusing on three interactions and the results. And, and these, at their core, are really interactions which bring hope. Or interactions that bring hope. The first interaction is the interaction with the shepherds, and that's in Luke chapter 2. And then I want to turn back to the interaction with the Magi and the interaction with Herod, both of which are in Matthew chapter 2. The shepherds, Luke chapter 2, verse 8, in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night, and an angel of the Lord appeared to them. The glory of the Lord shone around them. They were terrified with fear, but the angel said, Fear not, for I bring you good news of a great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And the angel makes the announcement. Have you ever wondered why the shepherds were important? Are they just an add-on? Is that just for color, you know, a little background to the whole story? I, I know why Mary is there. I know why the Lord specifically chose Mary. I know why the Lord specifically chose Joseph. He was at the house and line of David, and he was a righteous and godly man. I know why the Lord had it happen in Bethlehem. That had been promised from Micah 5, as we saw. And as you, you understand history and you, you read, all, you kind of understand why it was then in that particular season. But shepherds, why, why this focus on the shepherds? Why were they the ones who received the first announcement? 
Commentator Leon Morris in his commentary on the Gospel of Matthew talks about how shepherds generally were seen with bad reputation in that culture. They were unable to observe religious things. They probably were ceremonially unclean most of the time because they weren't able to get to the temple uh, for the sacrifices, even though they were raising uh, sheep. Unfortunately, they were often viewed as thieves. And if they were in the neighborhood, you wanted to keep everything locked up, especially your daughters. Uh, that was an eye-opening idea. Um, but it, that's what people thought about shepherds in that day. Now, that's a very broad negative stereotype. And it, it's unfair to generalize that all shepherds were like that. Others think of shepherds as simply representative of the poor and the downtrodden, because the shepherds would certainly not be the people of influence or wealth or significance. And in that way, it's very fitting that the first announcement of the birth of the Messiah would come to the humble because didn't Jesus come humbly uh, in as he was born. There are some who point to Bethlehem and Bethlehem's sheep, and specifically the idea that with Bethlehem being only a few miles away from Jerusalem, the likelihood was that these sheep were being raised for sacrifice in the temple. And there's a lot of symbolism in that. If the these sheep are out, if these shepherds are out raising the sheep for the sacrifices, you know. Bethlehem's hero, additionally, well, the reason they were in Bethlehem, anyway, Bethlehem's hero was David, a shepherd. Both the king who would be the great shepherd is the birth of the king who would be the great shepherd is announced to the lowly shepherds in the town of the birth of the shepherd who became that king. David, the king of promise. As we think about David, who received the promise that one of his children, one of his sons would be the Messiah, what was the most familiar psalm that David wrote? The Lord is my shepherd. The idea and the picture of being a shepherd is not something to look down upon. It's, it's something very exalted. In God's family, you know, Abel, one of Adam's sons, was a shepherd. Abraham, the father of God's people, was a shepherd, as were his sons after him, Jacob and all of the boys, the whole family. They were all shepherds. Well, there was a passage of scripture that opened up to me in a fresh way a number of years ago, and it's from the prophet Jeremiah. It's Jeremiah chapter 33. And it begins in the context of the wilderness when God's land is abandoned. It's a waste. There are not a lot of people there. There are not shepherds there. There are not sheep in the field. It is very, very desolate. And in that place, excuse me, I have a new Bible and the pages like to stick together. In that place, the Lord says, again, there will be a time when shepherds will be there resting their flocks. This is in Jeremiah 33, 12. In the cities of the hill country, the cities of the Shephelah, the cities of the Negev, the land of Benjamin, the places about Jerusalem and in the cities of Judah, flocks shall again pass under the hands of the one who counts them, says the Lord. That is a promise of the restoration of life. The nation had been evicted um, back in 583, 586, 583 BC, when Nebuchadnezzar deported the people. And the, the land was desolate for, for 70 years before people started to come back. Jeremiah is looking way ahead to the time when people will be back, civilization will have returned, there will be shepherds in the land, and the land will be fertile, and they will be, it will be productive. And then he talks about God's covenant. Verse 14, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise that I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days, that is, when the shepherds are in the fields and the flocks are there, in those days at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. 
In those days, Judah will be saved. Jerusalem will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he is called. The Lord is our righteousness. Does that person sound like anybody that you know of from Scripture? It is in the time when there are shepherds in the land watching over their flocks and caring that the branch, the, the, ends, the descendant of David, is going to come. And he goes on to talk about how David will not lack a, a, descendant, a, a descendant to sit on the throne. And so as I read Luke chapter 2 and why the shepherds, well, why not the shepherds? God had made a promise and God keeps his promises. And the angels spoke to the shepherd and who got to be the first guests at the manger to see Jesus. Long-awaited promises, 1,000 years before, as far as the promise of David's son, 500 years before the last king of Israel, 400 years of silence with no prophetic ministry under the ruler of foreigners. And now that the people of the Lord are back in Judea, the, the culture is being reestablished, and here are these shepherds out in the fields, and they are the first ones to know that God is acting to fulfill the promise he made centuries before. It was a promise to them as a part of God's people, but even more than that, it was a promise through them because they were a sign themselves that God was keeping his word. I don't know what kind of hope they felt, certainly when they had the message of, of the angel, the Savior was born, who is Christ the Lord. I have to think that that filled their hearts with hope, hope that God's promises long delayed were real and the person of the promise was coming. And it is first here to the lower class, the, the more humble of the shepherds. Ever wonder about God's keeping his promises? He will. He does. He doesn't always keep them in our time or in our way, but he will. And the shepherds received those promises and they had hope because there's hope for everyone. Well, you couldn't think of two more different groups than the shepherds and then the next group, and that is the Magi of Matthew chapter 2. We read the, the whole passage earlier in the early first two verses, so I'm not going to repeat them right at the moment. But, but first, uh, a couple of things just to get out of the way. Uh, how many magi were there? We have no idea. The, the song, We Three Kings, is a fiction. Uh, we think there might be three, or some people think there might be three, because there were three gifts. In this passage, they're not kings. In the passage from uh, Isaiah that we read earlier, they talked about kings coming. In Psalm 72, it talks about kings and rulers coming and camels and these kinds of gifts. But in this particular passage, it has nothing to do with kings. It has people who are magi. And we'll talk about that in just a second. The, the other thing is that the, the birth narratives, we have them all condensed in a very short period of time so that Joseph and Mary arrive in Bethlehem. Mary gives birth that night, sometime overnight. The shepherds come by morning. The Magi come. And it's all this, this crazy packed in event. And it didn't happen like that at all. Number one, Luke does not necessarily imply that the night Mary and Joseph arrived in Bethlehem, uh, Mary gave birth. The shepherds did come the day that Jesus was born. But when you read carefully uh, the, this in Matthew, they weren't going to an area of a stable. They were going to a house. And as you look at what Herod chose to do, Jesus could have been a year older, a year old, between one and two years old. And so we have to recognize it's all, it's all spread out in that regard. I think that just helps us to grasp the reality of the story. Uh, it's it's fun to put it all together, but uh, you, you do need to kind of keep some of the details straight. Uh, the last thing is the star. And the only thing I'll think, say about the star is there are a lot of explanations and possibilities about the star, but no one has the final explanation on the star. Is it a conjunction of planets that look like one large star together? Perhaps. 
It is a comet. Well, that means that's the word scepter. The scepter is the star and it has the tail on it. Um, maybe. Is it a miracle star that God placed in the sky specifically for Jesus' birth? He certainly can do that if he wanted. So there's a lot of different explanations. People have a lot of good reasons for that. Um, I believe there was a star, but I'm not going to try to tell you exactly what that meant. It was a sign. A star was a sign, and the Magi saw it, and it told them that an event had taken place or was going to take place. It happened soon enough that they knew it was coming, and so they decided to take a journey. And it was at least a four-month journey to travel 900 miles from where they would have been located over in Babylon. Over 900 miles, four months, maybe six months, maybe longer. They probably had a pretty good entourage as they came from Persia. Now, I told you the Magi were not kings. No, they were not kings, but they were advisors to the king. In, in Babylon, specifically in with the Babylonians, there's a word that Daniel became one of the chief magicians. You know, as the, the, all of those leaders that were fighting against Daniel and his friends, Daniel became the head over them, and one of the words that describes them is magicians. And that's not that they could do magic, but they certainly were turned to as spiritual advisors, people who understood the times in that culture. They would have been astronomer, astrologers. They would try to understand the signs as they would see them. And perhaps Daniel and his influence left some scriptural influence as people were, you know, were looking. They might have been thinking about the future of Israel and their coming king. I'll have more to say that uh, in just a second. <clears throat> the Magi, or the Magi from Persia or Media, some call them Parthians. That's another group that's within that area. They were a very, very powerful group of influencers, and they appear to have had a major role in the deposing and the appointing of a king over Judea prior to Herod. In fact, when Herod became king, which we'll talk about a little bit later also, um, the, the one before him that was deposed had been appointed by Magi, by the Parthians. And so when these men and their entourage arrive in Jerusalem and come to Herod, well, immediately you understand he's going he's to perceive a threat, not just because of a little baby that's going to come also, but he receives a very, a real, perceives a very real threat simply because of the history of Magi in recent, uh, in recent years. Well, the Magi, as I said, may have had some scriptural teaching. Balaam in Numbers 24, 17, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel. He will exercise dominion. He will destroy his enemies. In reading about some of the expectations in the first century BC into AD, there seems in some people's mind to have been a great expectation that God was getting ready to do something in Israel, that God had made promises in his people and it was getting to be time for him to bring it about. And a great leader was going to come who had accomplished God's purposes for Israel and the world. That was even a secular expectation in some circles. And people knew, even if they didn't believe in everything that was going to happen, that when Israel's God acted, often immense and great things took place. Well, as the Magi met with Herod, and Herod came back and talked with them about Bethlehem, they ascertained the correct destination, and they left. And in verse 9, it says, after listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star they had seen when it rose went before them till it came to rest over a place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped. God did not use angels 
to spread the message as he did with the shepherds. He used a star. He used other things that we are not aware of. But as he gave a message to the weak and the helpless and the poor, he gave a message to the powerful. As he gave a message to people in his own tribe in, in Israel, he gave a message to the Gentiles. These men who knew history, who men who were who shaped history, men who believed in supernatural things. And these people came and their actions proclaimed Christ as Israel's true and messianic king. Israel's true and messianic king. The, the Magi received the word of hope, and they came and worshipped because they believed that the era of the Davidic king would be an era of wellness and prosperity. I think back to Genesis. The Lord says, the one who blesses you, I will bless. They came and they blessed Jesus. But he also said, the one who curses you, I would curse. And that brings us to our final interaction, and that is Herod. We've read of Herod in the passage, and you know enough about Herod. He was a wicked ruler. Herod's father actually knew Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar was the one who appointed him as the, in a, to a government post in Judea in 47 B.C., Ten years later, Herod, who was, became called Herod the Great, became king, and he deposed the ruler that the Parthians had appointed a few years before. Herod is known for intrigue, paranoia. Uh, it was legendary in his life. And so when it says in verse 2 and 3 that when Herod was troubled, all Jerusalem was troubled with him, uh, that's absolutely true. Herod's temper and his actions were awful. Herod believed. Herod believed this message categorically. He didn't question the message at all. He believed in what the Magi said, so much so that he went to investigate. He believed that something had happened in Bethlehem. He believed it was likely that the Messiah had been born in Bethlehem. But there's no way he was going to accept that. In fact, he began to, to think of ways that he could put a stop to it. He wanted to find out where and how to get there um, to exactly the place. And so he was going to have the, the Magi try to tell him, but they left another way. And so he acted the only way he knew how, and that was to slaughter people. And he executed all of those little children, those little boys in the area of Bethlehem. Because there was no way that he would willingly relinquish his throne. When he felt threatened, he had killed his favorite wife. He had killed his sons out of paranoia. He had no problem killing anybody. So he heard the same message that the Magi heard. He heard basically the same message that the shepherds heard, but he did not react with the same manner. Rather, he rejected it. Can you imagine what would have happened if he had received that, you know, he would have he would have received news of a king stronger than Augustus who had appointed him. He would have received a hope greater than death, and certainly he was going to face that in a little bit, but he would not yield in the face of the message of God's salvation. Can you think of people in your life who have heard the very same message of grace, the message of the truth and the gospel, but they just have no interest whatsoever. Some angrily reject, some are just passively indifferent and don't care. I can think of people whom I have known like that. They don't want the message of hope. Oh, how different things could have been if Herod had been like the Queen of England. In September of last year, some English media had attributed particular remarks uh, to Queen Elizabeth at a recent time, I guess, in her life. But uh, research has shown it was not Elizabeth that said these things, but rather another king a century before, um, Victoria. 
The dean of Canterbury Cathedral, Frederick Farrar, uh, shares these words. After the sermon, the queen had been at church that particular Sunday. After the sermon, the queen, that is Victoria, spoke about the topic that he had chosen. And she said, oh, how I wish that the Lord might come in my own lifetime. Well, the preacher paused and he asked, why does the majesty feel this earnest desire? Oh, the queen was, she replied, uh, queen replied with quivering lips and her whole countenance changed and brightened. And she said, I should so love to lay my crown at his feet. What a reaction to the light of Christ and the hope of Christ's coming, of welcoming him and receiving him, that the shepherds welcomed him and, and received him, and it filled them with joy. The, the wise men, the magi came, and they welcomed him, and they were with joy as they worshipped him. And Herod refused, and it paid out in his, in his um, life. The shepherds raising the sacrificial lambs who would lay down their lives for the sins of those offering come unknowingly to the true Lamb of God who one day would lay down his life as the sacrificial life lamb for them and for, for you and for me. Magi, royal advisors, kingmakers, they came and bowed before the one before whom all wreaths of empire, as we sang or will have sung in our worship service, all crowns, all symbols of rule and authority will be laid down at his feet, because he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Herod heard the same message. And his response was, no way. No way. I'm, in fact, going to do everything I can to stop it. And he died. And his family died. And his line ended. I've heard some people talk about how it was a terrible mistake for the Magi to go to Herod in the first place. All that took place with the slaughter of the innocents and Jesus having to flee to Egypt. But as you read the scripture, that was all in God's plan. What if it wasn't a mistake? What if it was grace? What if it was one last chance? What if it was that one opportunity that God shined a little light right for Herod, the grace of God to a despicable, evil man to see if, yes, he would bow and recognize there is a king over him, there is a God over him, announcing the greatest gift and the greatest event in history so far. What could have happened if Herod had said yes and humbled himself? Well, we know from history, Pharaoh had many opportunities, but he did not humble himself. And look what happened to him. Nebuchadnezzar didn't humble himself, and then he was judged, and then he did, and he was restored. The point is, no human, no human leader, be it president, king, prime minister, anyway, no human leader but Christ is the Christ. No human commoner like you or me, but Christ is the Christ. But he came inviting us to him, to welcome him, to worship him, to yield, to serve, to declare. He came that you and I might know there is hope for us, hope, hope even for everyone. Jason Ingram and Matt Marr have written a song called Hope for Everyone. I'm going to share it a little abridged and adjusted from the way they actually sing it in their song. Hear the angels sing to announce our king. What good news they bring. There's hope for everyone. They came from afar. Wise men saw the star. Shepherds heard the choir. There's hope for everyone. Coming on the clouds, hear the trumpets sound. All of heaven shouts, there's hope for everyone. Come, let us adore on the manger floor. What are you waiting for? There's hope for everyone. 
We are waiting on the promise for the one who lights the darkness, bending low to be among us. Bring your glory in the highest, Jesus. All of heaven shouts, there's hope for everyone. All of heaven shouts, there's hope for everyone. That hope is to carry with us in this life because Jesus is with us in this life. And as we walk with him, we have hope in our lives. That is beyond this life, our hope of heaven and being able to be with him forever. Friend, do you have that hope? in your life today? Have you, like the shepherds, come rejoicing? Have you, like the wise men, come bowing down? Have you, like Herod, come saying, no way, no how? Come be like the queen. Take the crown of your life off your head. Place it at his feet. And you will know his love. You will know his peace. You will know his restoration. You will know hope in being who he made you to be. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, the season of Advent, Christmas, now leading up to Epiphany, the the coming of the Magi, it is a season that's filled with hope. It's a season that's filled with promise. It's a season that's filled with the gift of your birth and the wonder of all of those events. It's a season that launches the most beautiful life that's ever been lived. And we thank you for the grace that has come to us that we can see it and appreciate it. Oh, Lord Jesus, we want to welcome you into our life afresh today. We know that you're here, but we want to come and bow before you and confess you are King, you are Lord, and we want to be yours. And ask that you send us forth with the same joy that the shepherds had as they went back thinking about all that they had seen. And that that joy would be contagious in the lives of people that we know who have no hope at all. They're just lost in darkness. They don't have to be. Would you help us to help them to find the light of Christ. We will thank you for that now. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for being with us this morning. I would call your attention to the playlist on our YouTube channel. The uh, uh, final week for some Christmas songs, but uh, songs that are so rich and full in the whole life of Christ and his ministry and that remind us of the things that he is coming to do. I did put that song by Matt Marr uh, on the list this weekend, and so it's an addition on, but it's a very energetic and and joy-filled song. I hope that you will join us as we continue to work through Matthew. Love to hear you as the year begins. Um, God bless you as, uh, as you go from here. Amen.